So thank you for the, the lovely introduction. Um, and uh, as already explained, I'm working as a clinical psychologist and national specialist, um, CAMS OCD, BDD and related disorder service at the Michael Rutter Centre in London. Um, and this morning I'll be talking to you about understanding and treating BDD in young people. So just to give you a bit of an overview of what we'll be covering this morning, we'll be spending some time understanding what BDD is and understanding what some of the most common symptoms of BDD are. So thinking about some of those worries, uh, some of the behaviours that we um, come across quite commonly. We'll also then move on to thinking about, sorry, that jumped there. We'll also move on to thinking about how to access help um, for BDD and what to expect from the assessment um, and treatment process and really focusing on CBT for BDD and what to expect um, from that treatment. So what is BDD? Um, and I'd like to start off by sharing, um, to start supporting understanding this question a bit better, a video of a young person who was assessed and treated in our service um, and talking about his experience and, and treatment process with BDD. Um, again, at the beginning, this young person shares quite difficult experiences um, of his BDD. So you may want to step away from the screen in case um, this is something that might um, sort of bring some difficult memories up.
Alif, there are um, a couple of messages coming through that could we, we can't hear any sound. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. That's okay. There's a couple of messages in the chat box. Um, is, that, is that for everyone? Or... Yes. Yeah, I, I can't hear it either. And I think, yeah, a couple of our attendees can't. So okay. I don't know if there's maybe an option when you go to press the play button within your PowerPoint. I think it's... Sorry about that. Is it starting now? I don't think it's giving an option to... The microphone is... Sorry, can't, that's okay. We can't is, hear anything at the moment. Is it the same now? Yeah, it's still the same now. I'll just quickly, I don't know if. Hello, I was just wondering yes. if, that, um, if the link's available, perhaps people could, we could put the link in the chat and people could have a look on their own time maybe. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, um, I can't see an option, I'm afraid, to add um, the sound here. So what I might do is pop that in the chat afterwards and um, yeah, people can have a look in their own time. I'm really sorry about that. No worries. No, that's a yeah, great idea to pop it in the chat. Okay, brilliant. And I can make sure I put that in, uh, in there afterwards. Um, I, can, I can give a reminder at the end if that helps. <laughs> yeah, that would be brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'll quickly switch to um, my next slide and what the video basically covered, which hopefully you'll see when you're able to view it in um, in your own time, is that it really helps us understand sort of some of the the main features and what BDD inv can involve and what BDD is about. And this young person in the video would be talking about spending an excessive amount of time worrying about his appearance, and BDD typically involves spending um, a lot of time worrying about a perceived flaw in appearance and a, by a perceived flaw we mean um, flaws in appearance that other people can't really see or generally wouldn't notice and in order to sort of in a way sort of correct or fix um, disappearance flaw young people can find themselves carrying out lots of behaviours um, or, or things like mental acts so it might be that they're doing lots of makeup routines, ex wearing excessive makeup, um, wearing lots of um, specific types of clothes to cover up their physique, for example. They might find that they're completely go um, avoiding going out to certain places or seeing um, certain people or completely um, stopping leaving the house um, and feeling pretty isolated. Um, in terms of mental acts, they can be things like um, comparing their um, appearance to people that might be sort of they're seeing on the screen or walking um, down the road. So it can take quite um, uh, a broad range of um, certain mental acts um, that we can cover later on in our talk. Um, what we know is that BDD causes a considerable amount of distress and really gets in the way of daily luck life and daily activities, things like being able to go to school, um, socialise with friends, uh, spend time with family and lots of people can also describe stopping doing the things that they used to enjoy as well so we know that the impact and the distress caused by uh, BDD is really really great. Another thing that we know about BDD is that appearance worries are generally not related to, to worries around being um, fat or, or weighing too much. Um, and typically not affecting <clears throat> eating patterns. It's, it's not unlikely that someone might have um, worries around their, uh, their weight um, alongside BDD as well, but we know that typically this isn't uh, a core feature of um, the condition. So we always find it helpful to do a myth busting exercise in BDD because there could be lots of information out there that isn't quite accurate. Um, and the first, um, example of this is ideas around BDD being about vanity. So what we know is that this is false and we know that BDD is absolutely not about vanity and that it is a mental health condition that causes a significant amount of distress for the young person and the behaviours that they might be doing, so things like checking their appearance in the mirror, wearing excessive amounts of makeup or wearing certain clothes, um, isn't because they're finding this enjoyable, it's to reduce the extreme distress that they're experiencing, which doesn't fit with the idea of vanity at all. 
We also know that um, the idea that cosmetic surgery helps BDD um, patients overcome their concerns is false. Um, what we know is through our clinical experience and through some research is that generally, um, no matter how much people might feel that correcting their appearance uh, on the outside might help change the way that they feel about their uh, appearance. Um, this, is, this isn't something that has been shown to be effective and that people can often find that they're really unhappy with the outcome of the, the surgery. Or if um, they find that they're, they are satisfied with the outcome of um, any procedure they've had, that this either isn't very long-term and can shift soon after the procedure or that the appearance worries have sh shifted a little bit where they've now started to worry about um, aspects of their appearance that they haven't quite um, been worried about before. And I guess it's also important to say that when we work with young people, um, they might often describe that a couple of um, years ago, they may have been worried about a particular part of their um, appearance, like their shoulder, for example, but that over time that can change um, as well. So that a new concern might be that they're more worried about their facial features. So we know that BDD can move around as well. Um, we know that BDD isn't caused by social media and we feel it's really important to highlight this point. Whilst there is unlimited access to um, social media content and, and the images that might come up and highly edited um, and photoshopped images that set these really unrealistic um, standards about how the human body and face uh, should be looking and it, it's um, and we, we can be more exposed to this and that can then make someone feel more sort of distressed about the way that they're looking um, and increase some of the behaviors potentially that they're doing. Um, so there is, there is that element of the way that we might be interacting with social media, but what we feel is really important to highlight that social media isn't the cause of BDD. Um, as we know that BDD, like other mental health conditions, um, like for example, uh, depression uh, and eating disorders um, and schizophrenia has been around for um, much, much longer than social media has. So BDD is a Western problem is another myth, uh, and we know that's false. We know that the, the way that BDD presents across um, the world it is the same in terms of the time that young people can spend um, really worrying about sort of perceived um, flaws in their appearance, the extreme distress that they experience, along with the interference that these, um, these worries and these behaviors can cause in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, it is is the same what might what they what we might see differences in is more of the content of the, those worries uh, and that might be more based on the social norms of a particular culture so you might find that some cultures um worrying about your skin or the shape or um size of your eyes might be more common than others for instance but we know that as in terms of the structure uh, of bdd and the key symptoms it's same across the world Another myth is that there is no such thing as BDD in adolescence. Um, it's just normal to worry about appearance. And we absolutely know that this is false. We know that whilst adolescence and sort of in the teenagers, it can be common to worry about your appearance. Um, BDD is very different to this. And again, it comes down to the amount of time that an individual can, can spend worrying about their appearance uh, and doing behaviors um, repeatedly to, to correct this and to bring this dis extreme distress down. Um, and that the impact of BDD is, um, and the interference cause it, it is really significant. So it can stop people from going to school. It can stop people from um, spending time with their loved ones. And really we can hear um, you know, some young people who feel really stuck in there um, and isolated in their homes or in their bedrooms. And, this is a very different to, to um, more usual appearance worries where the young person might not as be impacted um, by these worries. So moving on to thinking about some of the common um, BDD related um, worries that we can hear about. Um, you can see here that there's quite a large uh, list here and a, a quite a large range going from, you know, some of the most common things being around skin and hair, and we often hear young people talking about um, concerns about their nose and um, parts of their body, for example, 
um, it could be sort of the, the size or shape of their legs, um, their, um, their, their chin, their eyebrows, hips, so it can be a huge range of concerns. And it can also be aspects such as for example, sometimes people can worry about the way that they might sound, the way that their facial features might be moving as they're um, talking to other people as well. So there's quite a broad range there. Um, and interestingly, what we know is that on average, their young people can report about five to seven um, different types of worries about their appearance. Um, so it can, and, and these can uh, sometimes change over time as well, or they can remain quite focused. Um, on those specific worries. We know that for some people it can be the worries might be more focused on a particular part of their body. Um, so it might be that it's the size of their or shape of their shoulders or their, their nose, for example. Um, so it can feel different to sort of having lots of worries but more, more focused. Um, I'm sorry, the slides are playing up a little bit. Um, and uh, on other occasions, sometimes people can describe thinking that it's not so much about a particular part of their body that they're worried about, but their more general appearance and how their features might come together and how their features might fit and feeling that this doesn't feel quite right. Um, so it can, these worries can present quite differently from one person to another. And this is an example of some of the common, um, most common ones that we can hear about. In terms of um, common BDD related behaviours, we can hear a lot about the idea of camouflaging, so covering up, um, and this can be through either the types of clothes that someone might be wearing, it might be through if uh, there's a particular worry about um, the size or shape of, um, of a young person's head, for example, they might be camouflaging using hats and scarves. Um, we know that excessive makeup can come under this headline as well of camouflaging, you know, that comparing appearance to, um, to uh, other people, and that could be anyone from sort of um, friendship groups uh, to people that walk just down the road to celebrities and social media influencers, for example. Um, and we know that mirror checking can be quite a common um, BDD behavior as well, people describing that they can really feel they're inspecting um, their appearance in the mirror for hours. Um, um, at a time. Um, we know that grooming, excessive grooming is quite um, a common uh, BDD related behaviour. So we can hear lots about young people saying that they might be using multiple products that do the same thing. So someone might be using three to four different types of moisturisers, um, or they might be using multiple different types of shampoos um, to that essentially do the same, um, ha have the same effect. Reassurance seeking is another common behaviour, um, and this is where we can see also families being drawn in. So young people can say that they ask their parents or, or their siblings or their friends um, about how they might be looking, and this can range from whether they look okay to whether the other people can spot um, what the young person feels is um, a flaw in their appearance. Um, we know that skin picking can also, can also be quite common um, in BTD as well. And I guess the other key thing to, to outline is the, the level of avoidance um, that can be present um, in, in BDD as well. So it, this can range from avoiding sort of coming into contact with other people, uh, and that could be by stopping going to school, um, stopping going to sort of work or joining family occasions. It could be avoiding mirrors and all sorts of reflective surfaces. So it might be that people in their homes might not have um, mirrors up um, and they've removed it because it's too distressing. Um, or they've even removed, for example, pictures of themselves um, from around the house. So lots of um, a range of sort of behaviors that we can, we can see in BDD. Another um, important aspect of BDD to, to understand is muscle dysmorphia. And this is basically a, a, a type of um, BDD where there's a strong sort of worry and pre preoccupation about the belief that um, someone's body might not be muscular enough or lean enough or that it's too small. And in response to these worries and, and the distress that this can cause, um, young people might find that they're working out really compulsively, um, they're really checking their appearance and their muscle shapes and size in the mirror. 
they're using a lot of um, uh, over-the-counter products and on a strict regime, for example, to bulk up. Um, and they might be using protein shakes or these um, nutritional supplements that, that they might be getting um, online, for example. And the idea um, of not doing these behaviors, so the idea of, for instance, missing a, a gym session might be really distressing for someone. And they might, um, you know, become really upset at the idea of not being able to, to do that. And um, so we know that this is um, an aspect of B2D that we're, we're understanding a bit more about uh, um, and it's important to be aware of. And it's one that we see most commonly in, in males. So some facts about BDD. Um, we know that BDD is a really common mental health condition. So around 2% of teenagers we know have BDD. Um, and this makes it more common than mental health conditions like schizophrenia. We know that there are more females uh, than males in the general populations um, that have BDD. However, in more specialist clinics, um, this number might be equal. So an equal number of males and females might be assessed and treated. Um, we know that BDD can start at some, any life point, um, at any age, but most often we see that the starting point of BDD is before the age of 18. And we also know that uh, other conditions uh, can be quite common in BDD, like depression um, and anxiety. And it's important to outline that there are some um, particular difficulties and risks that are common in BDD. And some of these, as you may have heard um, uh, during the talk, is around being housebound. So it might be that because of the distress experienced um, from the um, appearance uh, concerns uh, that young people find to have a way of avoiding this might be to to not leave um, the house and that they feel less anxious in that environment and this can mean that they're unable to go out to the you know shops spend time with their friends and sometimes even restricted feel restricted to certain parts of the house as well so they might find it difficult to step out into the garden too. We know that dropping out of school it can be quite common for, for young people with BDD um, and it can be really hard to sort of focus in the school environment and, and affect learning as well and eventually um, when BDD uh, isn't treated it might mean that it's difficult for the young person to, to stay at school um, and they end up leaving. We know that there are sort of um, higher rates of uh, suicidal ideation so thoughts about sort of um, not wanting to be around because of some of the difficulties that they're experiencing. Um, and it's unsurprising that depression can be quite common as well, um, as well as self-harm. And we also um, know that there could be a particular risk around finance. So this is when young people feel the urge to, to buy um, products to help um, correct some of the, the flaws they perceive in their appearance. And this might also include things like um, cosmetic procedures, certain outfits, certain expensive products. And this can all mean that they might find themselves getting into debt or it might put pressure on their families and finances as well. So another question is around why do people get BDD? And there's lots of research carried out, being carried out to help understand um, this question a bit better. Um, and at the moment, there isn't a, a sort of understanding of the exact reasons uh, of um, BDD. Um, but what we do know is that there's like other mental health conditions like depression, for example, or um, social anxiety, that there isn't, it's like that there isn't a single cause um, for BDD. And there are lots of different fa factors that um, come together that might make someone more vulnerable to this condition. So these can be things like um, biological factors and environmental or psychological um, factors that, that might play an important role that we'll move on to thinking about. Um, but what we do absolutely know is that BDD isn't anybody's fault. So it's not the fault of the young person, it's not of the fault of their, their family, their parents or, or um, their friends, for example. I mean, it's really important to highlight this um, point because lots of people and with BDD and their families can feel responsible um, for the condition and we know that this isn't the case. 
to some of the things that we know can make um, someone vulnerable to developing BDD might be around sort of um, biological factors. So um, genes, brain chemicals, um, certain sort of um, family history presentations. So we, we have some research showing that BDD can run in families and that um, if you have a relative with BDD, for example, your chances of developing BDD might be higher. Um, uh, and also if you have a family history of mental health difficulties, that also um, a, a risk to developing BDD might be a bit higher in that scenario as well. We, um, there aren't any genes identified um, that specifically are, are linked to sort of the cause of um, say BDD, but you know that there are likely to be multiple um, genes um, at play. Um, and we also know that there might, there's a role sort of reduced activity of certain brain chemicals like serotonin um, that might make someone vulnerable to BDD. In terms of the more environmental and uh, psychological factors, um, we know and we hear quite commonly about sort of teasing and bullying and stressful life events that have happened for young people. Um, so moving uh, school, um, losing a loved one, those kind of situations we know that might increase um, experiences of stress uh, and increase vulnerability to BDD. We know that there are certain types of personality traits like perfectionism um, that might be more commonly reported in individuals with BDD. Um, and this might be a factor that might be driving appearance concerns and a specific sort of factor associated with um, BDD vulnerability might be around aesthetic sensitivity and this um, is basically that the idea that similar to musicality um, people might differ in their aesthetic skills and, and they might place more um, value on appearance so they might then um, be more conscious about their appearance and more aware of variations in their appearance as well which um, might make them then more vulnerable um, to the condition and this uh, particular idea is supported by um, the the fact that lots of people we we see in our clinic with BDD either have an educational background or sort of um, um, an interest or a, a desire to pursue careers in sort of the arts and design sectors um, and this has very much been our sort of experience uh, in the clinic and we've seen um, lots of talented work produced by the young people that we've worked with and I've included some examples here of um, some of our young people who have contributed bits of their artwork and, and designs to some of our information sheets and books um, so we're always really grateful for that and always really love to see um, some of this talent. So a key question is why um, is BDD underdiagnosed? So one um, explanation to this might be that people might be seeking treatment um, for BDD outside of mental health care settings. They might be going to um, places like orthodontists, cosmetic surgeons, dermatologists, um, rather than seeking help um, from a more psychology um, setting. And this might be because people in those settings might not be as aware of, of BDD and the idea that people might be um, thinking of an idea that if they fix their appearance um, that their distress and, uh, and their worries might sort of um, sort of reduce or, or disappear because of this. Um, so I think it's very important uh, and it's an important line of work that we're with we're thinking of in our clinic in terms of raising awareness of BDD across lots of different settings. We know that clinicians can sometimes be unfamiliar with BDD and this can contribute to BDD being underdiagnosed um, and they might interpret some of the symptoms uh, that young people are reporting as fitting with other conditions like depression or social anxiety disorder and therefore might be um, young people might be misdiagnosed with these conditions and BDD uh, is a missed as a result of that. Um, we also know that young people and, and pay individuals with BDD more generally find it really hard to, to talk about their appearance concerns um, unless they're directly asked about it. And this is for lots of different reasons. So it might be that they're worried about being judged, um, about being vain when they're talking about worrying about their appearance. It might be that they're experiencing a lot of sort of embarrassment and shame when they're describing their concerns as well, which can really make it hard to open up about these difficulties. And I guess another idea is that 
they might not want to draw attention to the aspects of their appearance they're worried about uh, as well and this might then make it less likely that they're, they're going to share um, these difficulties and mean that the condition goes underdiagnosed. We also know we've we've also had the idea that BDD symptoms can, can be seen as being normal, a normal part of being a, a teenager, for example. So young people might try to open up about their concerns, but the, they might find that because the other person isn't perceiving the, the flaws in their appearance that they're um, seeing, that they're, these concerns aren't as picked up um, um, because of that. And again, it can be seen as being a part of being um, growing up as a teenager, which we know um, isn't the case. And this, these are some of the reasons why um, BDD has remained on, underdiagnosed. So how to get help for BDD? Um, here's a bit of a, a sort of a guideline on a pathway and how you can access help. Uh, and essentially the first point of contact is like to be your GP and asking for a referral to your local CAM service for BDD assessment. Or if you're closer to 18, that referral might go to um, IAP services. And if you're uh, referred to CAMS, um, assessment and screening will happen at, uh, at this point and that will be an indication of whether BDD is confirmed um, or whether BDD isn't a good um, condition to understand difficulties under and alternative um, recommendations will be made but if you are on that BDD sort of confirmation pathway then intervention will either be offered in your local CAM service or it might be referred on to a national specialist uh, service um, and a and that's where you'll receive an assessment um, and an intervention uh, will be offered um, at that point if that's appropriate for your needs. Um, and you'll be on that pathway until um, uh, you receive your full packet of uh, package of treatment um, and enter the follow up phase of your treatment. And that's a part that we'll sort of talk about in a bit more detail um, later on in the talk. So thinking about how BDD is treated, um, the initial part is thinking um, is the assessment process where young people um, come and meet um, other mental health professionals and where they'll be spending some time trying to understand what some of those difficulties um, related to their appearance concerns are and how that's affecting them. And similar to OCD, um, a modified version of the um, uh, Cybox, which has been created for young people with BDD, will be used to run through a checklist of questions that help identify the key areas of difficulties. Um, and once you sort of go through this process and um, spend some time answering these questions and thinking about your BDD um, uh, as carefully as possible, this will indicate a score that ranges from 0 to 48. And we know that higher, the higher the scores, um, the greater the, the severity of BDD symptoms um, can be. And as a part of this process, um, we'll also find out about the history of BDD, so how it developed um, and whether there are any other difficulties that is, is going to be helpful to hold in mind. And also thinking about any sort of family um, members who might be um, in the past or currently experiencing um, mental health difficulties. We know that in terms of treatment, um, NICE recommends that the most effective evidence-based treatments for um, BDD are cognitive behaviour therapy with exposure and response prevention, as well as SSRI medication. As we've discussed, cosmetic surgery for, uh, for lots of reasons is not recommended because we know that that's not an effective treatment that provides long-term um, out good outcomes. And in terms of the, the structure of uh, CBT uh, for BDD and young people, this usually involves 20 weekly sessions um, with exposure and response prevention being the, the key um, ingredient in, in treatment that we focus on. Um, we know that homework tasks can be really important to support progress um, in treatment and give the young person opportunities to practice um, what they've learned, particularly ERP tasks in their own environment. Um, and we also have uh, sessions joined by parents um, so that they're a part of that learning process and they really also learn about how exposure and response prevention works so that they can really support their young person um, outside of treatment. Um, and we spend, as you can see, um, 
the first few sessions uh, thinking about psychoeducation, so learning about um, BDD. Um, we then move on to fighting back with ERP, which is the core component of our treatment package, before spending the last couple of sessions on um, relapse prevention and planning for any sort of challenges that might come up along the way. We have regular review points at certain sessions, so um, sessions 7, 14 and 20, and then once the young person's in follow-up, we will then um, review at those sessions as well. So very quickly, psychoeducation will involve learning about BDD and anxiety um, and how anxiety present, can present itself in BDD. We sort of formulate a, men, um, a maintenance cycle of BDD and really try to understand what some of the, the beliefs um, are in this process and how life experiences may have contributed to this. Um, and most importantly, thinking about what are some of the triggers and what are some of the behaviors that are keeping BDD going. And we then move on to thinking about uh, listing some of those behaviours uh, in the hierarchy format, ranging from behaviours that you imagine you can't imagine quite stopping at the moment versus behaviours that um, might be uh, a, a starting point to start challenging um, BDD with. So in terms of our formulation, we spend some time thinking about some of the negative thoughts that the young person might be experiencing. For example, in the, here we hear about a young person talking about their worries around sort of the size of their forehead being too big and what, what this will mean uh, is that others might be disgusted and won't want to talk to them. And we think about the emotions that the young person is experiencing and often we can hear about anxiety and shame being quite common um, in response to these thoughts as well as hopelessness and anger. And then we think about some of the behaviours that are carried out to reduce these um, feelings. Um, and give that short, very short term relief to that anxiety or distress. And we can hear about sort of avoidance and camouflaging behaviors, um, really focusing on um, appearance through sort of mirror checking. And also we can hear that this is also the point that families can be, find themselves being really drawn into BDD through reassurance seeking um, and um, avoidance, for example, of parents or, or siblings. Um, doing things for the young person because they feel unable to. So we, this is more the maintenance part of the, the cycle where we think about how what are some of the factors that are keeping BDD going and what are some of the situations that um, trigger the, this response and this cycle. Um, and in session, we'll also think about some of the life experiences and how things like being bullied or teased at school have influenced beliefs around appearance as well to understand why there might be that particular focus um, on appearance and why certain situations are quite triggering for a young person. We then move on to fighting back with uh, ERP. Um, so as you all have heard, exposure is all about sort of facing the fear uh, with the perceived for um, visible, if that's possible, um, and then preventing uh, the action. So fighting the action uh, and those BDD safety behaviours, things like checking, avoidance, um, camouflaging, for example. So a typical example might be going to uh, the shop uh, as part of the exposure um, without wearing a hat, which is a response prevention um, in combination that we know can be quite effective. Um, and again, we take a very graded approach with this um, so that it might be that going to the shop without your hat, for example, might be a big step to take. Um, and we might sort of break that down into thinking what part um, would it be just sort of what initially working, leaving your home, walking down the road, how much of your, of your head might be exposed, for example. And the goal of ERP is really to reduce the impact of these behaviours and the distress and the interference with daily life that that causes. And we do this in a really great gradual, planned and repeated way. Um, so basing it on um, your hierarchy uh, of appearance related concerns, um, planning out what the exposure and the behaviour to be resisted will be, and staying in that situation until anxiety has come down over time without you having to um, do a BTD behaviour. And really repeating these tasks outside of the sessions because we know that practice is a key component of successful ERP tasks. So why do we fight back with ERP? 
if we think back to a time, for example, where we face a situation that we feared, um, for instance, going on a, a roller coaster, we know that the first time we do it, we feel really anxious and there's an increase in our anxiety. Um, what we know is that over time, without us having to do anything, that will come down. We know that when we face that situation again for the second time, the anxiety still might be there, but not quite so bad. And it might not take as long um, for it to come down naturally. And by the third time, we know that it's not quite as bad again. Um, and if we keep going with that principle, we know that and we face that situation over and over again, at, at a certain point, we'll no longer notice it, that feeling of, of anxiety at all. And it's, it will become a situation that isn't anxiety provoking to us. So it's the principle that we know that anxiety comes down over time all by itself, even when we stay in the situation. And that the more we do something that is fearful to us, the less anxiety provoking it becomes and anxiety come down, comes down much quicker. So fighting back with uh, ERP means that we have the opportunity to, to demonstrate that anxiety and that discomfort can come down over time. It helps us gather evidence and challenge some of the beliefs that the young person might hold about appearance. So um, beliefs around um, no one will want to talk to me unless I look better or I look different, for example. And ERP can really help build self-esteem in ways that also can be helpful outside of worries about um, appearance concerns and the principles of exposing yourself to fearful situations and resisting and fighting the action can be relevant across the board um, in your day-to-day -day life as well. So quickly going through relapse prevention. Um, this is the part of treatment where we know that it's helpful to sit back uh, and take stock of what has been most helpful and um, review what's been learned and what's really standing out for the young person and um, as well as thinking about what are some of the upcoming events that might be stressful and um, that we need to plan for um, and really sort of um, tailor create a bit of a blueprint of what the young person will do to build on their progress in a self-led way and what support that they might need from their family for example to keep their progress going and um, and then we come back and review um, at the one three six and twelve months points of treatment once weekly 20 sessions of CBT have come to an end um, and have a, also a quick checking on um, BDD symptoms as well. So similar to, to what Sasha outlined in her talk as well, there might be some barriers to accessing treatment um, for BDD. Um, and that might be, as you know, we've covered that BDD is underdiagnosed because there are difficulties with um, how um, who might be aware of BDD at the moment. So it might take time to recognize BDD symptoms and to diagnose, um, to get the diagnosis and access treatment. We know again that waiting lists in CAM services can be long. Um, so once you have uh, been through sort of the process of um, attending your GP and being put on the CAMS pathway, there might be a wait for that assessment and for that treatment to start. Clinicians might not be aware um, of, of BDD as a condition and CBT treatment um, for this condition in comparison to other conditions um, like social anxiety, for example, or depression. So that might make it a bit um, harder to access treatment as well and also it can feel again as Sasha was saying it can feel scary to do ERP and before you get to ERP it might feel scary to talk about some of the um, some of the appearance concerns and, and difficulties that you that you're experiencing um, and then to, to move on to thinking about facing some of those fear situations and I think it's important to to say here that the, your clinician working with you would be really open and happy to hear about some of these worries and concerns so that they can support you in thinking about how they can make treatment sort of more um, accessible and um, what are some of the, the measures that they might be able to put into place that makes facing ERP um, less anxiety provoking um, initially. So it might be that tasks might need to be broken down in a bit more um, detail. There might be that you might want to go at a slightly slower a pace um, and all the while making sure that that's not quite feeding into the avoidance of facing the situations but helping you engage with that ERP process that will eventually help break um, and weaken that BDD cycle. And you're probably quite familiar with the, the great BDD um, 
foundation OCD action websites and the great resources that they have um, on these um, available on, on on the websites. So some uh, there's lots of information, for example, in the books that might be um, helpful for you and your families to read on. Um, there's lots of sort of uh, good information on the documentaries and TV programs that have been made on, on B, BDD that you might want to see if you haven't done so already. And lots of information on how to take, um, for instance, talk about um, BDD to GPs, for example, and some resources on there that you might find um, helpful to go through. So in terms of key take home messages, we would say that BDD is a very common mental health uh, condition in young people. We know that it affects 2% of adolescents. We know that BDD can cause a significant amount of distress and interference in a person's day-to-day -day life. We know that GP services and CAM services can be really helpful in um, letting you access, um, supporting you to access treatment for BDD and as difficult as this might be, it's really helpful to be able to talk about as openly as you can about some of the symptoms that you're experiencing with um, mental health care professionals or your GP so that they can link you into supporters as quickly as possible. And just finally, to say that you're really not alone. The BDD, like we've said, is a very common mental health condition and there is help available out there. So thank you very much for, for taking the time to listen and sorry for the, the technical issues during the talk. Thank you so much, Anef. That was a yeah, brilliant overview of BDD. Um, we have got um, a question in, mm -hmm. in the Q&A panel. Um, if you wanted to kind of check it out and, and answer sure. that one, I can... <laughs> Should I stop sharing my screen? For... Yeah, you can do, yeah. Okay, so... Um, it's from can you fully recover from BDD permanently so no longer needing medication and treatment so this is a really interesting question and I guess what we know is that our treatment can be effective um, for BDD and lots of people can find that they're reducing their symptoms and the impact of, of BDD um, and eventually it might be that their symptoms are, have remained um, low for quite a a long time and this is the point where they might want to consider stopping medication um, and I guess it's what we typically advise is that following treatment um, during the follow-up phase and potentially beyond if medication is found to be helpful that this might help sort of further um, apply some of the skills that you've learned to develop um, your build on your progress in that more sort of independent self-led way um, and to review then whether that might be a good point to to stop um, medication. So recovering from BDD is, it, as we know, is something that we've seen. And I guess it's also holding in mind that it's, it's a bit, it might be a bit of a longer process maybe than sometimes people might imagine. It might go beyond the, the 20 sessions and the, the 12 month um, follow-up period where you're finding you're using your skills more often throughout your day-to-day -day life and really finding that progress uh, um, and that you're building on that. Um, yeah, so that, and, and I guess these are helpful questions to also bring to the review um, part of your um, treatment process as well uh, to consider.